option was water driven by heat that turned it into steam at thousands of degrees centigrade, basically, gave it more power <coughs> than an atomic bomb. As you flew back over the lip, you could actually see out this way, see the lakes over here? This whole side of the top has been blasted out. Hmm, hit those lakes, incredible force, took the water right up this hill, up there, the water went right up there, and by the way, it was really good to be doing research there before civil order was re-established. Uh, after a little while, you couldn't get into the whole area at all. Okay, you see the uh, trees now pointing up the tree, but as the water went up the top of the next mountain, gravity began to act and it came back down, filling the lakes with trees. You'll notice the mountains are denuded of trees and forest. Of course, it was an advantage to know the man who owned all of this forest and leased the bits that he didn't own. Um, it was great to work with him and to get his knowledge and insight into trees. You'll see there's a little bit of water over here, um, flying over a bit closer, flying over every other year just to keep track of what was happening. Gradually, the trees began to sink, some fast, some slow. They'd had their branches ripped off. Most of them had, had their roots ripped off. And as you went there year after year, you will notice them standing up. Hmm. What was happening? Very simply, they were filling up with water at one end and turning up like this. And in case you wonder how that could happen, one of my colleagues, Bob Powell, was a student over in California at the time, and he and Steve Austin went up there to do some research. These are real trees. They're not resting on sandbanks. And in case you're wondering how it happens, very simply, you cut a rose bush, you put the rose stem into a vase of water, and you do so because the water will go up into the stem, correct? And keep the rose going for quite a while. And one of the things you know also is if you put a drop of red food colouring in there and a white rose, the red food colouring goes all the way up. So even though it's technically decapitated, the mechanical behaviour of the stem still takes water from the base and it takes it up to the top. So if you're a big trunk, like a tree is, you will get waterlogged at the bottom. Before you get waterlogged at the top, you stand upright and then you begin to sink. But before you've sunk, the bacteria have chewed underneath the bark, fermented the edge of it, and it drops off and sinks to the bottom. And notice the colour of this bark that's been retrieved? Jet coaly black. By the way, coal is an old word. You even find it in ancient Egypt, and it's what that colouring was that they put under their eyes. Jet black. Okay, several years later, there are still trees floating, and there are still trees sinking, and there are some rather famous photographs from underneath the water such as that. Diagrams such as this. Now, by the way, the Americans, the Australians in this last century were not the first to discover polystrate trees. You have some very interesting historic records in the days before ships were so big, it didn't matter what they hit. Ships captains reporting, hey, we've sprung a leak. We ran into a tree in the middle of the Atlantic. And it poked through. It wasn't floating that way. It was floating this way. You have some rather famous experiments done with plants to see how do they sink. Well, one of the things I did was travel all over the planet to test how do trees become polystrate. You will see here the high water level and the low water level. You will see my photographs of the sticks. Okay, they've been washed in, vertical, horizontal, and at 45 degrees. This is not an artificial behaviour. This is actually how trees, sticks, little or big, actually behave. Now, when you have a look at the dam at Jurassic Ark on Friday, if there's any sticks in it, have a look at them. In fact, that's one reason we're taking you up there. We're going to show you an experiment that's happening before your eyes. Meet Daryl. Daryl's our curator up at Jurassic Ark. He's the guy whose job it is to keep the plants alive, or make sure when they're in the tank, they sink. No, he doesn't cheat. Here we are putting sticks into a tank and we are leaving them. And the reality is they sit there for a while and then they do that. Oh, time span? One year? One month? No, one week. That's all it took. But by the way, when you put the rose stem in the water, how long does it take the water to start going up? 
It's actually instantly, isn't it? The mechanism that does this in plants works whether it's alive or whether it's dead, and it starts immediately. The water will come in the bottom end, and it will automatically go out the other end. So there is our polystrate tank. Isn't that impressive? Well, it was until a tree fell on it. Uh, just last week, smashed it to pieces. So we've had to erect a new one. So yes, if you haven't found the donations box, they're out there, one on one end, one on the other. Uh, I'm in good favour with the Administration of Creation Research because I remembered to bring the donation boxes. So you want to help us repay the cost of all these tanks, we'd encourage you A, to come to Jurassic Ark, but B, use the donation boxes. Replace the smash tank, that's easy. What we're going to do next is gradually add sediment so that the trees are actually trapped before they can fall over. Because in reality, the experiment we're doing, there are no roots to hold the trees upright. But then again, most of the polystrate trees I've seen don't have any roots either. And the ones that they do, you know what you find? If you are patient and persevering enough and you have a good hand and a solid hammer, just keep digging out along the roots and inevitably, in 95% of the cases, you find the roots are broken off. Uh, when Mount St. Helens blew up, one of my great joys has been to walk up and down the rivers looking at the logs that are washing out from all the volcanic ash and here they are standing vertically where they have been dumped. And you say, how do you know it was dumped? Well, now in the last flood, all the root base is eroded out. So you can actually see the whole roots, but they're all snapped off. This tree was whammed by something faster than the speed of sound, ripped up branches, uh, leaves, etc., on their way out to Hawaii, but the whole of the tree trunk up through the air and dumped. 10 kilometres, 20 kilometres, impressive explosion, washed down rivers, etc. By the way, you see the last one? Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. If you want to fund our research, we need all the help that we can get. Because there are many geology students out there who wouldn't even go to a church. There are many science students, there are many young people who actually think there's no way they could believe the Bible because all the fossils have been proved to take so long they don't even think of flooding, let alone Noah's flood or catastrophic behaviour. OK, let's tell you something interesting about some of the size of these deposits. Um, one of the things I've learned over the years is that the British had a habit when they owned the planet, at least that's what they thought, of naming everything after where they'd come from. And uh, what do they have in Newcastle, in England? Coal. So on the maps, everywhere I see Newcastle, usually guess what's associated with it? Coal. Of course, you know why it's called Newcastle, don't you? Because the old castle burned down in about 900 AD, and they had to build a new castle. So if you think you've got history, you ain't got nothing. Um, a history. So down in Newcastle, Alabama, there are vertical fossil trees. And what we are looking at is the carboniferous deposit that goes from Alabama up through Tennessee, OK, here's a young student. He's now in Germany. I hope to be seeing him later this year. And we're in a mine in Tennessee, in the Pennsylvanian. Yeah, the Americans actually even have to change the name of the rocks. You know, they threw the tea in the Boston Harbour. They've even changed the names of half of the rocks. But the fact is, the Pennsylvanian in the USA is the equivalent of the Carboniferous of the UK. And Carboniferous has nothing to do with millions of years. It's got to do with, guess what, in the rocks? Carbon. Coal. Okay, here's a rather famous one. You can pray for this young man, David Reeves. Um, he's done, doing a great job. Uh, he's one of the next youth generation of creation leaders there. He actually sent me an email today about putting our DVDs on his TV show on TBN. We're grateful and happy to do that with him. But look at those trees. They're incredible. There's no doubt about it. They stand upright and in many cases provably have no roots, no branches, and they've been buried in less time than the tree take took to go rotten. But that's the USA. You see, by the time you get to Nova Scotia, you can actually follow these trees all the way from Alabama, all the way, right the way through to the edge of Nova Scotia, etc. I know personally because I've almost walked every inch of it. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but not too much of an exaggeration. And we have a photo file of trees that drives you crazy. Um, just showing that they are unbelievably widespread. So if you exit from Canada 
and you cross over to England, you will discover, and there's the first coal mine in England I went to, the Butterwell coal mine, and English coal mines are basically almost shut down these days. And I was giving an address to the British Coal Board and they were talking about this, and I, I told them the reason why. You see, you go to the Butterwell coal mine and their coal seams are like this. I said, you come to Australia, we've got coal seams that are 100 feet thick. And if you don't want the coal, mine the gold. Because that's how you know, some of our famous coal mines were actually first established. But the interesting thing is, this is still the carboniferous deposit. And it continues on. Now, when you ask the question how big these coal beds are with all these fossil trees, I could bore you stiff because I've made my career out of going to these places just to check what's there. Okay, um, take the word of a man who I admired greatly in geology, Professor Derek Ager. Not because he was a Christian creationist, but because he did one thing that most geologists don't do. He said, let's go and see what's really there. And he photographed it and he recorded it and he made himself fairly unpopular by actually saying things like, the early catastrophists, you know, the first geologists who are mostly Christian creationists, they were much more accurate because they reported what was really there rather than using theory to try and get away from observing what's actually there. And here's what he says about the coal fields. They extend essentially in the same form from Texas to the Donetsk coal basin north of the Caspian Sea in the USSR. You can see this is a rather dated comment, but uh, that's a fair distance. And in his day, the measurement was about 170 degrees of longitude. Question, how do you explain a swamp that covers about half the planet, where all the rocks are being formed slowly while the trees hang around waiting to be buried? But since his day, of course, um, even more remarkably, we can follow these trees down into Western Australia, and you'll even find them over here. Ah, interesting but little known fact. If you follow the Sydney Basin coal field, you find up near Lithgow these polystrate trees. And there was a big argument in the early days. Is this Triassic? Is it Permian? Is it Carboniferous? Well, you find the fossil trees and they're just as catastrophic in Australia. Australia excuse me. Okay, question. Derek Ager was on the edge of moving to a new what you'd call paradigm in geology. His book was called New Catastrophism. Why? Because actually a catastrophe is about the only way you can bury a tree before it's fallen over, particularly when it doesn't have any roots. And catastrophes don't do slow. Have you noticed that? Volcanoes are not known for taking their time. Uh, they are dangerous because largely they are catastrophically, unbelievably fast. Floods? It's five years ago, isn't it, since Jurassic Ark was almost demolished by our 2011 floods in January. And the problem was 16 inches, 400 mils of rain in four hours. That's catastrophic. Wow. And so Derek Age was on the edge of saying, hey, flooding works, this works, we've got to go catastrophic. Why do people reject this? Um, the Apostle Peter wrote some interesting things about water and about the flood. I have a suspicion that the Holy Spirit picked Peter because of his background. You know, year five dropout, took up fishing, tried walking on water. Um, he had a lot of experience in this field. But uh, the Holy Spirit uses the Apostle Peter to say in chapter three cha of the second book, know this first that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. Hmm. Now do you realise the Apostle Peter is actually making a prophecy about end times? And it's one that really has come true in your days. Now, now he's not saying in the last days unbelievers will come. There's been unbelievers galore, uh, particularly since Adam sinned. But if you haven't met people like Dawkins face to face, scoffers is a much tougher word than unbelievers. They will mock you. They will scorn you. 
How could you believe this, John Mackay? There's no real geologist who believe in creation. Dr. McIntosh, if you were a real scientist, you wouldn't believe in intelligent design. How can you be so unintelligent? Hmm, scoffing, just decrying you, denying your reputation, doing their best to destroy you. Um, they will come in the last days and they will deny, A, the world was created quickly, it was covered in water, and the same world was destroyed by water. And he says in verse 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved under fire, uh, reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Okay? There's a neat summary of what's happened in the last hundred years, particularly since the coming of Charles Darwin, who was really the disciple of Charles Lyell, who walked along those beaches in Nova Scotia, saw all the fossil trees standing upright, and did his best to get rid of Noah's flood, the judgment of God, the authority and accuracy of the word of Moses and the word of God, and he basically, painfully, you have to admit, has succeeded beyond his wildest desire. But that's finishing negatively. Let's try and finish positively. Um, we've told you how to get there. Go to creationresearch.net, click research, scroll to polystrate, then also search and insert polystrate to be positive. There's our tree this year, Andy. Notice it's all eroded from down here now. We can actually see the base of the tree. Great stuff. You'll just have to come on another field trip. But I took a group of teachers on a field trip not too long ago, organized by these two. Now, see this guy here, a uh, science teacher, and he shared his testimony with me. He loves this stuff. He's a science teacher. He uh, has his degree in that background area. And he said, when I was a student at university, I became an atheist. Okay, what was his logic? Oh, no, he's brought up in a church-going family, but when he inquired about the accuracy of the Bible, when he inquired about the accuracy of Genesis, and when the theologians and pastors and they brought speakers in to say, well, listen, the world has been proved to be so old, you don't have to believe the days in Genesis are real days, which I sadly have to say is a popular position out there, particularly among so-called evangelical theologians. You know what he shared with me? He said, if what those men said was true, then you could read Genesis. Everybody knows it says the world was made in just six days. But if the word D-A-Y-S, if the word day doesn't mean day, then does the word G-O-D mean G-O-D? Ah, you realize he's just caught all those theologians out at an unbelievable hypocrisy? And he said, if I can't believe in days, I can't believe in G-O-D. And he said, I became an atheist. Oh, how come he's now leading a field trip with John Mackay, the creation guy? Well, he said, when I came across all the evidence for creation that you guys and others had dug up, he said, I became convinced the Bible was true from the beginning. Don't be surprised, because the Apostle Paul wrote over to the whole church, really, uh, including Timothy, who received it, test everything. Only keep the things that are true. If people really wanted to do real research and real science, you can actually stand a tree up out there and see how long it takes to be slowly buried, see how long it lasts without roots before it falls over, see how long it is before it rots, how long it is before it's covered up. Uh, you realize you can do that? And you will discover, like people like me have discovered, like Marcus found, it don't work. It's a lie, it's a deceit from the beginning. Uh, don't be surprised, Mark reacted that way, oh, sorry, uh, his mate reacted that way. If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, said Jesus, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And as I love to suggest, flip it around. If people do hear, listen, accept, believe Moses and the prophets, they can be persuaded through one rising from the dead. The joy we have in this ministry here is yesterday we had one of the first, uh, in fact, he was the first man to become a Christian through this ministry. And that was a long time ago when we sat down in the, the hall there and we led him to Christ and he's still with the Lord going on. What a joy because he discovered he actually could believe his Bible from page one and he's looking forward to the last page becoming fulfilled as I am. If people do hear, listen, accept, believe Moses and the prophets, they can be persuaded through one rising from the dead. Can I encourage you to come back for our Bible teaching tomorrow, our devotional on Jesus Christ as the triune Godhead or as a member of the triune Godhead.